Welcome to Gen Z Hoops. The Gen Z basketball, coaching, and sports business show. On this podcast, you'll learn from professional players, coaches, and executives from all over the world and see the court in a brand new way. And now, joining you courtside, your Gen Z host, John Hartafillis. Hi, Coach Ryan. What's going on? How are you doing? Doing great. Um, su- super cool to get the chance to talk to you while you're already in the in the G League bubble and like, about to, you know, to tackle on something that that's never happened before. I'm um, really cool that you're able to take the time um, during all that craziness and and really excited to talk to you about all the amazing stops and journey and the journey you've been on in this coaching world. Yeah, no, I I appreciate it. Thanks for reaching out and uh, always happy to talk hoops. Awesome. So to, to get us started, can you walk us through your path in getting on this lifetime of coaching and what that looked like for you? Yeah, sure. So I I graduated high school and I had some smaller college offers. I, I wasn't a very good player. And uh, my high school coach, who was uh, my two best friends, father, he was like a father to me, uh, offered me a job overpaying me to work for his mortgage lending company. I had the opportunity to take that job and become his assistant coach. And so I did that from 18 to 20. And uh, at 20 years old, I decided I wanted to coach full time. At the time, my goal was to become a, a head college coach. And so my plan was to go to college because uh, I hadn't started college yet and become a manager. So I, I left work and I, I decided to go to South Florida and uh, be a manager. And at the same time, I actually ended up becoming the head coach of that high school team that I was an assistant at at Oldsmar Christian. And I was a manager at South Florida and a head coach at Oldsmar Christian when I was 20. And then after being a manager for one year, just wasn't wasn't for me. Uh, I, I wanted to focus more on uh, coaching high school. And I also got the opportunity to meet David Thorpe, who ran the, tro- the pro training center. And he was preparing NBA guys for the draft, was working with veteran NBA players, and I got an opportunity to start working with him. And so from 20 to 25, I was a high school coach at Oldsmar Christian and working with Coach Thorpe with the draft and working with some guys a little bit full-time throughout the season. He was kind of one of the first guys to really do that. Then uh, at the high school, I ended up leaving. I went to junior college uh, to be an assistant coach at Wallace State Community College and moved away from Florida, uh, where they paid me 700 bucks a month. And uh, my wife had to stay in Florida to support me. And she was teaching at the high school I was coaching at. Then uh, that year, at the end of the year, you know, her favorite show was House Hunters International. And she asked me to look into coaching internationally. And uh, so I reached out to every American coach I could find overseas that was on Facebook at the time and just kind of shot him a message with my background, my experience, and that my wife wanted to live abroad and and one coach responded and uh, ended up going to China. A uh, coach by the name of Joe Welton responded, and, and he kind of gave me my chance, gave me my break into coaching internationally. And so my wife and I, we moved to China when I was 27, uh, which was an amazing experience. Uh, the league was very, very talented that year. Stefan Marbury, Tracy McGrady, Gilbert Arenas was in it. There was you know over 40 guys that had played in the NBA. But the cultural experience of living in China – uh, was really good. It was a great experience for us to realize that, you know, in other parts of the world, there are many things culturally that we could take away to help us grow as individuals. But, you know, that would really make America a better country. We did that, really enjoyed it, came back home and Coach Thorpe had six full-time NBA clients and asked me if I could help them that year. And so we had Kevin Martin, Corey Brewer, Ed Davis, Nicolaitis, Gal Meckel, and Omri Caspi. And so that year I did that. And that was kind of the first year I hadn't been a part of a team. You know, I've been doing all the draft workouts, all of the veteran work with the veteran players throughout the season, but I had always kind of been a part of a team. And that kind of hit me right there. It's like, you know, that's what I want to do. Being a part of a team coaching professionally, because I love the player development. It's the background that I have, and it's the base and foundation of my coaching philosophy. And so uh, Coach Bill Peterson had gotten the Erie Bayhawks job. I was fortunate enough based off the way that I, I had figured out how to network, because like as, as you've, I'm sure, have experienced as a young coach, trying to network is not always easy, right? Like, 
how many emails do you send? How many phone calls do you have where people just don't respond at all? That happened? Yeah. So. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> all, all you need is one though. All you, like, like you said at the beginning, all you need is one. All, all you need is one. And so, you know, there's a way to start networking. The, like the first year I'd gone to summer league, no one would really talk to me. And uh, I didn't have a lot of money. And so it was expensive to go out there. But, you know, one thing I did notice was everyone needed a ride. People were paying at the time, you know, $20, $25 for a taxi. And so I came back home and I told my wife, I was like, you know what? I'm going to rent a car next time I go back. And I just drive people around. So like when I'd go back, I didn't even really watch the games. I'd just be waiting in the lobby, watching people walk out and be like, hey, you know, do you need a ride? I got a car. And I'd be like, where are you going? And they'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm going here. I'd be like, oh, you know what? I'm going the same direction. I'll drop you, which, you know, I was not going the same direction. Well, one of the people I got to drive around was Bill Peterson. I, was, I actually drove him to the interview for his head coaching job with the Orlando Magic for the for the G League job. And uh, I'd known Coach Pete through some mutual friends, and he was kind of from our area. So he offered me the opportunity to come and be his assistant coach. Uh, and part of being the assistant coach in, in terms of salary wise was you had intern responsibilities. You know, you had to drive the van, you had to do the laundry, you know, had to actually clean the toilets a little bit in the locker room. And uh, so I did that. And after that year, my wife had really wanted to live in Europe. And uh, we got an opportunity from an American coach that I met while coaching in China. Uh, he took over a team in Germany and kept in touch with them throughout the year and offered me to come be his assistant. So we, we picked up and moved to Germany, which was an amazing experience. It's a beautiful country. Uh, really enjoyed coaching there and living there. And we got the opportunity to go from Germany to Hapol, Jerusalem, went from Hapol, Jerusalem to being a head coach in Slovakia to then got the opportunity to return to Hapol, Jerusalem, and then very fortunate to get the opportunity here with the Erie Bayhawks and the New Orleans Pelicans. Of course, and there's definitely so much to unpack there. Um, especially considering how I relate to that so much, especially um, with considering the fact that I also coach at the high school level at 20 years old. And it's definitely something that's that's unique that most people don't do. Uh, my, my quick thought on that immediately is just, what was it like for you doing it at, a, at a something like, like that, that really no one really is doing at the age of 20 and deciding between coaching at the high school level over being a manager at the college level? What, what did it look like for you? And, and what's it like kind of being that was so close in age to your players, but still taking that role? You know, I mean, it's... It, it was a great experience, you know, at 20 and to be, a, I think being a high school coach uh, helped me grow a lot as a coach. Like, I think I'm a much better coach because I did it. Now, if, if you look at career path, my career would have been further along if I would have gone to be an intern, maybe in the NBA. I didn't even know you could really do that. But like if uh, if I could have gone to be an intern in the NBA after being in college, you know, I think my career would be further along, but I don't think I would be as good of a coach if I would have taken that path. And and I think when you're younger, you know, because I'm older than you, I'm not much older than you, you know, but it was like yesterday when I was 20 years old and I was trying to figure it out, you know, like, how do you get here? How do you make it? How do you grow as a coach? And, you know, I think being a high school coach, you know, for that five years, I essentially got to coach basically a thousand games. I mean, we played spring, summer, fall, but, you know, we played in every kind of league that there was available, you know, outside of the season. And I just got to coach, coach, coach and get coaching reps. And that was huge. And from college, you know, I'd gone there with the intent to become a college coach. I didn't enjoy my experience as a manager. Uh, I would first off say at 20 years old and sometimes thinking you know more than what you do there was an arrogance about me uh i was i was arrogant at 20 but also i think oftentimes at the college level managers may be mistreated because they're the lowest people on the floor and you know i i never mind working hard i never mind you know, I, I mean, when I was 28, 29 years old and married, I had to move away from my wife to go to the G League to do laundry. It wasn't the problem. It was how people were treated. And from that experience, and also in fairness to the coach, it was year four, they'd been losing. There was a possibility that they were going to get fired. And, you know, you can't think of it at 20. When you're 20 years old, you're not thinking about 
not only you losing your job, your staff losing your job, them losing the opportunity to provide for your families and the stress and pressure that that can put on them, which in return can impact how people are treated and not necessarily out of a character reason, but out of they don't know how to deal with the stress and frustration. And that's something at 20 years old, I couldn't grasp. You know, I didn't have kids. I didn't have wife. You know, I, I was just like, why am I being treated like this? And so that was kind of like the experience was like, you know what, if, if that's what college is, I don't want to be a part of that. And at the time, you know, getting to work with Coach Thorpe and, and coaching guys that were 20, from 2025, we really got a lot of players that were not supposed to qualify. And so, you know, we had kids living with my wife and I, my wife had tutored them for the SAT and the ACT. You know, we made them, you know, attend class and do their homework. And if they didn't do it, they didn't play. And watching these players be able to qualify and go to college was very fulfilling for me. And at the time, I wanted to be a combination of Bob Hurley and David Thorpe. Like that was like my life dream. And, uh, you know, as you get older and you get married and you're not getting actually paid to coach high school, you begin to realize you have to make a living. You know? So that was kind of the adjustment, but it was uh, coaching high schools. I, I think one of the best things that ever happened to me. Definitely. And it's, it's something that I take so much pride in and I love every second of it. And, and thank you so much for sharing that story about your experience, especially as a young coach in college, because it's something that people might not think about too much or touch on, but it is true that, that there's, there's things like that, that maybe we don't fully understand. And then there's more to the story and, and always context behind why people act the way they do. Um, going on over to what you, 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 you mentioned coach David Thorpe a bunch and, and the work you've done with pro training center and working with so many NBA lottery picks, first round picks and, and really high level players. How does that kind of evolve since you started in 2005 and then kind of the transition into what you have now in basketball HQ? Yeah, I mean, it, it was something to where, you know, obviously the entire individual development business has evolved significantly since 2005. You know, back then you had IMG Academy, you had David Thorpe, and there were, there were a few other people doing it. And, uh, and then now it's obviously evolved to where everyone is doing player development. And so I, I think that the market has totally changed and has obviously become saturated in many ways. And, you know, for me, being able to be with David Thorpe, who's, you know, the best player development guy I've seen in the world, uh, gave me a big foundation. You know, it gave me a foundation as a coach, not just on the development side, but on the actual coaching side, right? And at the end of the day, if you're in the coaching business and you're in the player development business, it's your job to inspire and figuring out how to inspire, you know, some of the best players in the world is a great challenge. And it's something that then pulls into exactly what I'm doing now. You know, you're in the G League and you have to figure out how to inspire these guys and, and not just in terms of, their growth and development, but how to inspire them when, you know, you got 13 guys that all want to play that all think that the best way out is by scoring, you know? And so it's like, how do you inspire them to play the team game? How do you inspire them to eat right? How do you inspire them to know the sets? And uh, so it was a huge foundation for who I am as a coach. And, you know, it was, it, it was massive for me to learn and to grow and to still have coach Thorpe as a mentor. And, you know, from that, it kind of led into basketballhq.com. My wife's eldest brother uh, is a very successful entrepreneur who owns, you know, 500 websites. And her, her middle brother uh, was a very good college basketball player. And, you know, based off the experience of the older brother, him and I kind of went in together to build basketballhq.com. And we got a few of our friends and partners that are college coaches involved in it. Definitely. And it's, it's, it's awesome to see how much that's grown since you originally started it. And then thinking even back to um, what you had said about all the lessons you learned and especially thinking about and trying to inspire guys. And that, that must be so hard, especially from level to whether it's in high school, college, it's always a challenge, but especially at the G league level where you have so much roster turnover, it must it, it get especially challenging. What's it been like now becoming the first head coach of, of the Erie Blackhawks and, 
and and kind of how that ended up happening for you and, and, and what you've taken from the experience so far? Uh, yeah, I, so I got really lucky that the New Orleans Pelicans, you know, the New Orleans Pelicans uh, bought the G League team. And when I was there, Orlando had owned it, and then they moved their team to Lakeland. Then the Atlanta Hawks owned it, and they moved their team to Atlanta. And then New Orleans got it. And for me, I was very fortunate. I was coaching in Hapol, Jerusalem, and they were looking for an American international coach. And when David Griffin first got the job, David Thorpe knew him a little bit and had recommended me to him in general. And then they were looking for an American international coach, and they reached out to their international scout, Yaron Arbel, uh, who's Israeli and was living in Israel. And he put together a list of coaches, and my name was also on the list. So that was kind of the second name. And then I heard he was interested, and we happened to have Omari Stoudemire, who was on our team and part owner. And uh, I'd coached Omari. That was my second year coaching him. And Omari and David Griffin were together in Phoenix. And so Omari made a phone call, uh, which was huge in helping me get the job. And my agent, Brian Elfis, and they they did an excellent job uh, pushing. And I got to interview with Trajan Langdon and I was just really fortunate. You know, it's what you learn as a coach and in general, right, is you, you need someone to believe in you. You know, whether it's a player, whether it's you as a coach in your career, for most players and people, you need someone to believe in you and give you a chance. And, you know, at 33, I was trying to be an intern in the NBA. You know, my mentality was like, I'll be an intern in the NBA. I don't care if I'm an intern. I'll outwork everyone and I'll work my way up then, right? And no one would hire me except Fred Hoiberg. Fred Hoiberg was the only one who was willing to hire me and he couldn't get it approved because I was too old and too experienced to be an intern. And I go from more than willing to accept being an intern to getting offered the New Orleans Pelicans G League job. And I got really lucky that David Griffin and Trajan Langdon took a chance on me and believed in me. And when you look at it, it's something that we almost all of us need, whether it's a player, whether it's a coach, right? You need someone within your career to take a chance on you and believe in you. And for some people, it happens at 24, right? For some people, it happens at 34. And for some people, it happens at 44. And for some people, unfortunately, it never happens. And it doesn't doesn't determine who they are as a coach or who they are as a player, right? It's not like when I signed a contract to become the G League head coach that I was a better coach that day than I was the day before. The difference was David Griffin and Trajan Langdon took a chance on me and they believed in me. And I was super fortunate to get the job. And what you realize when you get the job is you get a lot of nice text messages that you deserve this, you earn this, you sacrifice for this. And all of that is true. I did sacrifice for it. I did work very, very hard. But there's a lot of coaches that are better coaches than me that also did that and deserve the job. You know, at, at the time, there was a, a coach named Connor Henry who would played in the NBA, coached in the NBA, scouted in the NBA, coached in the G League, won a G League title, and lost a G League title. And... If you look at it, who's more qualified for the job than me? And I just got really lucky that David Griffin and Trajan Langdon believed in me and took a chance on me. And, you know, it's a it's obviously it's a a massive step in my coaching career because of that. And without them, I wouldn't be here. Thank you so much for sharing that, because it's it's something that most people won't talk about in terms of, of exactly what that process looked like, but it really shines so much light on, on the reality of the situation in terms of how that actually works and, and getting someone to believe in you is the biggest thing. Um, and that's obviously something that I hope to do with this podcast that other people try to do in other ways, whether it's the coaching world or something else. But definitely the, the biggest thing is is doing your role to the best of your ability, no matter what role it is, whether it's in the NBA, overseas, wherever. Um, and uh, if you do it well enough, you'll get noticed. People will believe in you. And then the rest is history. And, and congratulations on that, because that, that's obviously something to be really proud of. Um, moving on to kind of what you're doing now, whether it's like what, the process of, of being in the G League bubble and what that's like, taking that a step further um, while, while you're in the bubble with the Bayhawks, um, who are some guys in your team that you're really excited for? And you think that even in the shortened schedule can really make some noise? Yeah, I mean, it's in the G League bubble for me, it's been great. You know, it's like you you can always find something to complain about, 
And it's like I try to tell our players in life, and one of the biggest things that helped me from going from being a younger coach that had worked with a lot of NBA players that couldn't figure out why I couldn't make it to the NBA. And one of the biggest things that helped me is when you change your mindset from I have to to I get to. Instead of making the mentality of like, I have to do this, I have to, I get to, I get to be in the bubble. You know, if the Erie Bayhawks job open up tomorrow, there'd be a thousand applicants with a hundred of them more qualified than me. I get to be in the bubble. I get to eat the food here. I get to, you know, be in a hotel room. And so for me, the bubble's been great. I mean, the G League put a lot of effort into it. Uh, I think it's well done. The food has been good. The experience has been good. They're trying very, very hard and they're putting a lot of work into it that would allow us to have a season because the reality is without the bubble, we wouldn't be able to have a season. We may start a season, but we wouldn't be able to finish the season without the bubble. You know, so for me, that that experience has been really good. And I've personally have enjoyed it with our players. We've got a lot of talented guys. You know, we we've added Omari Spellman who played for Golden State, who's been a leader for us, who's been 20 minutes early to everything. And, you know, he has a reputation coming in, had a great talk with him, and he's been not just good. The guy's been perfect, and he's been amazing to coach. We've got Jordan Bell, who's also coming back, who's been in the NBA, uh, who's an elite defender. Jared Utoff, who's played for quite a few NBA teams, and the guy is – one of the hardest work and most professional players that you'll come around. We have Justin Wright Foreman, who'd played at Hofstra, was one of the leading scorers in the country, second round draft pick by the Jazz, who is an elite off the dribble three point shooter. I mean, if, if you broke it down compared it to the NBA last year, you know, he would have been number one in the NBA and off the dribble threes of players that played that took more than uh, 43s. From there, you got guys that haven't been in the NBA like Jalen Adams and Tony Carr and Yoli Childs. And it, you can go down the list of, of the talented guys that we have on our team. And along with EK, uh, who would play for the Pacers, we have a bunch of guys with NBA talent. And we have a bunch of guys that are NBA level players. And the best thing about them is they care. Like they care about getting better. They care about working. They love the game. And as crazy as it sounds, it's not always the case, you know. But for me, it's it's been a great experience. And, and I think we've got a bunch of guys on our team that are going to end up being in the NBA one day. It's so great to hear that. And obviously, best of luck next a week from today when your team when uh, the team faces off against the Salt Lake City Stars to open up the season. And definitely can't wait to, to watch that game and, and the coming games and, and see um, all these dreams come true for a bunch of your players. Yeah, thank you. Um, moving on to kind of your a lot of a lot of the theories that you have and and, and your and your philosophy as a coach, um, I, I I really enjoyed listening to your clinic on the on the Summit Coaches Clinic, talking about how to play a modern style game um, without modern style players, which is obviously everyone wants to have a big that could shoot from three, but you don't always have that as a coach on your roster. How 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 is it possible to space the floor maybe without these stretch bigs and and really get good space and and really um, play that modern game? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Oded Katash, who was a head coach of Hapol Jerusalem, he just took over Panathinaikos in the EuroLeague, is the best coach in the world at playing with non-stretch bigs and playing a modern game. And, you know, he has recruited to his system and, you know, his value in bigs, which is not common these days, is not shooting, it's decision-making overshooting. And he's built a system based off utilizing what the NBA would call short action, uh, to to really utilize the spacing that he has with three perimeter shooters with predominantly having the top of the key and the corners filled between the guards and then the bigs roll in and exchange and in the dunkers. And he's built a more or less motion pick and roll offense off that. And, uh, you know, in Jerusalem, we were very successful since he's taken over Panathinaikos. If you take a look at their offensive efficiency and output, it is really – uh, exploded. And there's been some college teams that have adapted that style of play uh, after that clinic. But I mean, he's, you know, when I took the job there, I left being a head coach where we went 27 and 11, 26 and 11 in Slovakia in a great city, great fans, really enjoyed it. I had two years left on my contract. 
And to leave being a head coach to going back to being an assistant, it's not always easy. And I didn't know Oded. I, we coached against him in lot when I was in Hapol Jerusalem the first time. And the GM wanted me to come back. And I knew Oded was a great coach. I also knew pretty much his entire philosophy was the opposite of mine on basketball. And I thought it was a great chance to either convict my beliefs or change my beliefs and grow me as a coach. And, you know, I went in from day one and I was like, we need stretch bigs. He's like, no, 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 it's not important. And I was like, not important. What are you talking about? What? This is crazy. He's a genius. You know, his, his IQ and feel for the game as a coach is great. You know, he's been able to develop a offensive system that fits perfectly for non-stretch bigs. And utilizing that short action and space on the floor with decision-making bigs uh, helped uphold Jerusalem lead Champions League and offensive efficiency for the two years that, that they were in it and set the offensive, they had the greatest offensive season in the history of Champions League, you know, out of 32 teams. So, yeah, he's, he's an amazing coach with an amazing system. It's fantastic thinking about that because it's not something I've, I've never heard of that, that, that concept before, because all you hear about is how important it is to have stretch bigs and where the game is trending in that direction. But to think of them as decision makers instead of being shooters is, is really phenomenal. And, and we may touch on it a little bit, but the whole concept of a, of a rescreen and how that also helps in the, in the pick and roll in that action with, with those stretch bigs. How do you see that term or, or that or that action being used um, to really get the most out of those guys? Yeah, I mean, I, I think rescreens, as Oded would say, rescreens are a way of life. Um, you know, he prefers <laughs> he prefers pretty much 80% of pick and rolls to have a rescreen involved. And if you think of it like this, you know, it doesn't really matter what your pick and roll defense is. If on the first pick and roll, let's say you're in a hard hedge or a flat show or a drop, and the player is aligned perfectly. I mean, they play 100% perfect defense as a big on the first screen. To have them play 100% perfect on a rescreen is going to begin to fracture the pick and roll defense, right? Now, it may only drop from 100 to 80, right, on the second one. But when you're playing against a great team, and right, that's the goal as you're building your offenses, how do you win a title? How do you beat great defenses? You have to figure out when a team is a great pick and roll defensive team, how do you begin to fracture the defense? And in his offense, right, re-screens are going to begin to set little fractures within their defense to where by the time it's gotten to the fourth quarter, you force those bigs to defend 80 pick and rolls in the game. And so now by the fourth quarter, Right now, that pick and roll defense is 60 percent perfect, 70 percent perfect. And you can kind of begin to pick them apart. And, you know, he's really good at that. Depending on the different defenses that we played or the different teams that we played, there was an even more emphasis. It was like automatic. We've got to rescreen this game. We have to rescreen this big, you know, because they were so good in the first pick and roll uh of defense that make them defend too right you're also going to wear them down and that's where they're going to begin to make defensive mistakes i love that concept that's fan- that's so awesome to think about um and, and how and, and especially i love the quote i think i might ha- i might have to put that somewhere on my wall rescreens are a way of life somewhere that, be- that belongs somewhere yeah uh, i mean Oded, i think his perfect job would be if a team would just hire him to be in charge of rescreens you know he said in the nba you got shooting coaches player development coaches he just wants to be the rescreen coach I hope that job can open up in the next five years. That'd be that'd be great to see that with how big these teams have gotten. Um, I'm sure you do great in that. Taking things over to your specialty in, in rebounding and, and, how, and how passionate you are about the importance of rebounding and how that could really change games. Um, you've really uh, said before about how much of a, an emphasis you place on really crashing the offensive glass and sending five guys. Um, and, and I'm really curious because a lot of coaches would would be afraid of of the impact that would have on transition defense. And, and, and having guards are rebounding as well. What, what, what's your philosophy on that? And how do you see that as being such a, a huge positive for the teams you've coached? Well, Aaron Fern, who is an Australian coach, uh, was the head coach of the Cairns Taipans in the professional league in Australia. And he had the lowest budget there and he had to try to figure out how to compete with the bigger budget teams. And he had some very out of the box ideas and he created this tag up system. Now he's an assistant coach at UNC Charlotte. And there is no correlation between good offensive rebounding teams and bad transition defensive teams. You know, it's, it's a common misnomer, right? That being a good offensive rebounding team 
and is going to make you a bad or hurt you in transition. Now, what will happen if you send five to the glass and you're not a good offensive rebounding team, then you'll get your ass kicked in transition. But if we're getting ready to play your team, we're getting ready to play Xavier. We lead the league in an offensive rebounds and we're sending five to the glass. You got three days to prepare for us in practice. You know, that's what we do. We're the best at it. What are you doing in practice every day? I'm terrified. I'm, I'm terrified about letting you, you guys get 20, 25 offensive rebounds in the game because the last thing I want to do is be screaming rebound all the time. So I'm, I'm really making sure that we're good at defensive rebounding and, and hammering that home instead of sending guys out and train and uh, sending guys out. Right. So you're working on box yep. all week. And if one of your players leaks out and we get the offensive rebound, he's probably coming out the game. Right. So if you really think of it, being a good offensive rebounding team actually slows the transition defense because you're worried about giving up the offensive rebound. As a result, you're not going to leak out, you know, so if you end up, you know, we had games with 20, 25 offensive rebounds and we'd end up having 10, 15 extra shots on our opponents in Hapol, Jerusalem. And if you're a team, you know, like for us, we didn't press and trap and create extra possessions off turnovers, right? Offensive rebounds gave us the extra possessions and extra turnovers. If you are a pressing team, like let's say you're, you know, what Shaka Smart was at VCU, you know, then it flows in perfectly to what you're doing because you have to be up to press the ball anyways if you're sending five to the glass. Offensive rebounds are the third highest percentage play in the game. And if every coach talks about boxing out, why are you not talking about crashing the glass? Tagging up is a combination, right? And, and what it really is, the way that Coach Aaron Fern does it is it's a transition defensive system and the byproduct of it is offensive rebounds. In Hapol Jerusalem, I took his system and I tweaked it based on our personnel to where we were sending a little bit more aggressively than him. But for his system, you know, it's about sending five to the glass, you know, to be matched up in transition defense. And as a result, you're getting offensive rebounds and his rules are you can't run by the guys so you're you know you're always between your man and the basket defensively once a shot is taken you're just pushing them inside 15 feet and kind of scrumming them into the paint that's fantastic and then obviously a, a lot of coaches are infamous for just screaming rebound to get their players to to get more rebounds whether it's offensively or defensively when they're giving things up you've obviously broken it down to a science and it's it's enlightening to kind of hear this the side of it whether it's the tip concept or things like that, how do you kind of coach great rebounding habits to, because it's more than just effort, obviously. There, there's so much strategy that goes into that. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's like athleticism and length is helpful, right? But not every player has that. And if you go through and you watch, I mean, really break down and watch the elite rebounders that aren't the tallest, longest, most athletic guy, what you end up seeing are a bunch of skills that go into rebounding. And for us as coaches, right, that's exactly like we'll say box out, we'll say effort, we'll say go get it, two-handed rebounds, you know, but there's so much more that goes into being a good rebounder than that. You know, it's like passing, right? Like you just say be a good passer. Well, there's all kinds of passes you have to throw. You have to be able to throw it with two hands. Nowadays, if you really watch it, like the elite passers are one-hand passers, which goes against – a lot of coaching philosophy. And if you watch it at a young age in Europe, I mean, those kids at 13, 14 are coming off a pick and roll, slinging it with one hand, you know, to the corner. And in rebounding, it's all the same. And what ends up happening is if you're not drilling the skills that go into becoming a better rebounder, you're naturally not going to improve in those areas. And the mentality of like, this guy's a bad rebounder or a good rebounder, you know, the, there's, there's more to it. Some of it have a natural gift, but everyone can improve and it's more than just effort. And if you watch elite rebounders, elite rebounders are one handed extension catch rebounders. And most rebounders, they rebound within their area and they rebound with their arms bent. Like everything they catch is arms bent. Elite rebounders rebound out of their area with their arms extended. And they can catch a rebound with one hand with their arm extended up at 90 degrees, right? And then straight out to the side. And those are skills that you have to drill. You have to drill the catching. You have to drill the timing. And you have to drill it with both hands. And then there's some other skills that go into it on early effort rebounds. 
right? Like the first one to the ball is going to get it. And so when players are beginning to shoot the release, like if you watch, you know, elite rebounders in the NBA, you can watch Kevin Love as players begin to start their shooting motion. He's already making his early effort to get there. And right, then you've got other guys that are really good at wedging their defender under the rim and taking them out of position. So, I mean, there's multiple skills, you know, that, that go into how do you drill it? And for us in Hapol, Jerusalem, you know, like our concern going into that season was going to be defensively and rebounding. We had a bunch of bigs that weren't great rebounders. And we did a lot of individual skill work. We didn't even do rebounding drills as a team. We did a lot of individual skill work to build uh, those skills. And then... In practice and in games and film, we just held them accountable to what they were supposed to be doing. It's awesome to think about how putting that huge emphasis on defensive rebounding, um, on, on rebounding in general. Um, if Thinking about kind of maybe not to give too much away to all the coaches that are going up against you, but um, what, what you, you've spoken a lot about how a lot of players lose their effort after they first get hit, um, as, especially as, as defensive rebounders. Um, what, as a coach, what would you do to kind of make sure that they – or how, how, how would you drill to keep them aggressive in, in going after it? I mean, one is timing, right? Like when players start their shooting motion, you have to have that early effort because the first one to the ball is going to get it. And so, you know, one, you want to drill that timing with a little bit of resistance. Most of the time, especially for offensive rebounding, when a player goes to crash the glass, the moment someone touches them, they just stop, right? So it's like that, that constant pursuit of getting it around. And for a lot of our players, you know, we'll just straight show them like this is what the leading rebounders make, right? Like the leading rebounders in every league move up to a higher league, whether it's from high school to college, college to pro and all the various pro leagues, they continue to move up because every coach needs a great rebounder. And so one, it's the inspiration, right? Like why is it important for them to be a better rebounder? Two, it's the why, like, like, this is why you got to do it. This is the inspiration. This is a why, right? This is the how. This is how we're going to build it. And then you have the accountability to it, right? And so, like, you have to know those answers to the questions, right? And then you have to get on the guys every day. And at the end of the day, it's accountability. You know, when the game is over and you're showing them every clip, hey, you didn't crash here. Hey, you didn't go here. Hey, this was your opportunity for a get around. This was your opportunity for a wedge. This was your opportunity for an early effort. And so being able to explain it to them instead of just like, you got to go get it. Well, how do I go get it? That's important to be able to know the differences in those details. Oh my God, a hundred percent. I can't wait to listen to this podcast over and over and, and, and make sure I'm caught up in that to make sure I can communicate it to my players. And obviously if anyone ever asks me, Hey, like, how do I, how do I get the rebound? I, I will make sure to send them the link to this podcast episode immediately and make, it'll be all timestamps. So they know, Oh wow, this is actually how I do it. So coach Ryan, thank you so much for this absolute goal mine information, especially on the rebounding side. It, it, the knowledge is going to be so useful to me and I'm sure many others. So thank you so much for coming on. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Gen Z hoops. Make sure to follow, like, and subscribe on Instagram, LinkedIn, and all major social media platforms at Gen Z Hoops. You can tune in and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and every other podcast platform on the planet. Get ready for the next episode.